Can we get a huge round of applause for P. Resnick from Contender Solutions? The real, the real revolution was supply chains, not the containers. So, we basically believe that the same thing is going to happen in software. And then we can change this provider with another provider just because they are cheaper. We couldn't identify any players on the market right now that do optimization of, of the supply chain of software. Now, there's a lot of people doing security and continuous integration and all this other stuff that we're talking all the time about. But no one actually really sees the optimization of the entire pipeline. A lot of containers with microservices easily available everywhere. That's the point of cloud native computing. We're very proud to be part of Linux Foundation and cloud native computing starting today. Is that there are hundreds, possibly hundreds, and maybe even thousands of companies around the world trying to solve exactly the same problems. Just take all this stuff together and create consistent uh, platform that supports microservices. In the beginning, it's fine to put sysadmins inside the uh, development teams, but at the end, you want developer to be able to put the application all the way to the cloud without support of operations. It doesn't mean that operations go away, but it means that operations support the cloud and not involved in any way in the deployment of application. So the idea is to, to create a new environment, a new language, a new platform where developers can express themselves, basically help developers to define prototypes like this, and automatically create buildings like this based on those requirements. This tool will run on Cisco Cloud, and this one will run on Amazon, and I say, do the magic. Right? <laughs> magic means what is available, how much it costs, and give me options with trade-offs. Obviously, it's your choice now as a developer. Now you deploy, now this is a real running system. As you saw now, we moved from development view, from architectural view into operational view without any change. Change of interface, change of tool. So you can actually see here a real simulation. You can say, add a million users, let's see what, what's going to happen. And then you see containers added, added to the system. We need to have real programming language that can express, pro or we can actually write code that expresses the infrastructure. And it's very difficult to build frameworks if you cannot test them, if, if restart of the system takes forever. And forever for me is like five minutes. It's essential for, for thinking and, and uh, planning purposes to use graphical representation of this kind of systems. Because even with this diagram, I, I can't really believe you, you really understand this, right? But imagine I need to explain it with words. The demo I showed earlier with uh, services and, and policies and stuff, this is all eventually will be part of SHIFT. So, so Mantle is... Uh, is a Cisco project led by Cisco and we are taking part in it and helping Cisco to build it. And then essentially the entire cloud becomes a single machine that is distributed across uh, multiple data centers, clouds and whatever else you have. So essentially this is the goal for, for Mantle. Can we get a huge round of applause for Pete Resnick from Container Solutions, please? Good evening. I'm going to talk about cloud native computing and uh, post DevOps, or basically why we, I personally don't like DevOps, and I think there are better ways to do things. It's kind of weird to do it after a DevOps talk. But, What? Wow. Exactly. What? Right. <laughs> don't, don't need to uh, So what is uh, the mission of Cloud Native Computing uh, Foundation, which is basically what is Cloud Native Computing? What is uh, uh, application that runs natively on the cloud? I just highlighted some of the things. So Cloud Native Computing Foundation 
basically building distributed system, systems capable of scaling on tens of thousands of self-healing multi-tenant nodes, containers, dynamically managed microservices, and just easily available. Right, so a lot of containers with microservices, easily available everywhere. That's the point of cloud native computing. And from now on, I'm, I'll try to explain what it actually means and more specifically how we are trying to build uh, platforms to support this kind of um, cloud native applications. So first, we're very proud to be part of Linux Foundation and Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So I'm not just talking about some, somebody else, but we're actually part of this initiative starting today. So, okay, I said a lot of containers, microservices. So how do we start? And quite obviously, we will try with Docker. Just create two containers, everyone talking about this, everyone likes it, perfect, let's do that. It has this, uh, this uh, very cool cycle from Docker file through images, uh, deploy the container, put it in, uh, in a uh, Docker hub, and you can run it everywhere. Everything works, perfect. A few weeks later, you probably also need a scheduler. Right, so let's try to add Mesos or something else, it doesn't matter. Then probably console for service discovery. Possibly Calico, Weave or something else. Probably Elk. Now each one of those slides, it takes me like five seconds. It probably takes three to four weeks to just figure out that you actually need it and another five weeks to, to actually put it in the system. So, six months later, hopefully, you have all those, and more and more and more. So, I'm not saying it's a wrong idea, but... Who did this already? Okay, few. Amazon. Yeah, okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, so, did you stop to think what is the final goal? Or you just kept going? It's, it's a rhetoric question, because uh, in most cases people don't stop to think, they just keep going. They have a specific problem to solve, they solve the problem moving on. But essentially what it means is that there are hundreds, possibly hundreds, and maybe even thousands of companies around the world trying to solve exactly the same problems. Just take all this stuff together and create a consistent uh, platform that supports microservices. So, okay, fine, platform, but a bit of a theory behind uh, the, the rest of the story, why we are doing things in the way we are doing them. So first, this is the same wall of confusion you saw on the previous presentation and probably some other presentations. This is like a classics of DevOps. You have business requirements, a developer builds an application, throws over the wall, repackaged by operations, and then put on the cloud or some kind of platform. Fine. Obviously, it's a bad idea because the wall is a bad idea. You need to, to put these people together, this guy and this guy in the same room. Then you have a DevOps team, and it's, a, <coughs> it's probably far easier to communicate if you sit in the same room and actually talk to each other. But it doesn't mean they suddenly understand both sides of the wall. It doesn't mean that developers now suddenly have has 20 years, of, 20 years of experience in operations and the sysadmin suddenly knows how to program. Yeah, they probably can do that a bit, which is fine, but they, they cannot have 20 years of experience in both fields simultaneously. So, what, actually, what it actually means is this guy knows half of the programming, half of the sysadmin, and this one half of the programming, half of the sysadmin. Which means they're just not good programmers and not good sysadmins. So the idea is to, uh, to do the same thing that happened with software testing. 
software testing in the beginning there was no testing, then when it became too many bugs occurred in the code, then there was a software testing as a discipline, the team was growing, 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 at some point the communication became the problem, and they started putting the testers inside agile teams. Now in the beginning those were agile teams, later they became just development teams, no testers anymore. So we don't do any tests, I mean we do a lot of testing, but it's all part of the normal development. We have no testers. So we believe that the same thing should happen with DevOps. Basically, in the beginning it's fine to put sysadmins inside the uh, development teams, but at the end you want the developer to be able to put the application all the way to the cloud without support of operations. Now, it doesn't mean that operations go away, but it means that operations support the cloud and not involved in any way in the deployment of application. Because human invo involvement in the process, in any process, make it slower and more error prone. This is fine, but, but it, it, as I said, developers cannot or shouldn't understand all the internals of, uh, of the sysadmin work. So if a developer needs to define exactly how many CPUs should be used by his application, how many, how to define the router, how to configure all kind of virtual machines, how to deploy this stuff, it will just take too long and then we are back into DevOps world. So the idea is to, to create a new environment, a new language, a new platform where developers can express themselves in a reasonably uh, simple way, understandable by developers, which is code, some kind of programming language, where you can express your infrastructure requirements, your programmable infrastructure requirements, and define it the same way as you program multi-core development, for example. Now, what it means is that we want to basically help developers to define prototypes like this, and automatically create buildings like this based on those requirements. Because if developers need to create really, really fine uh, blueprints of each single room and each single wall with all the materials of such building, it really means that it will take forever and it will never happen. So, what we want to achieve is, again, in other words, is to create a very simple prototype that will be translated through multiple layers into a uh, functional system or more detailed system that can be later used by construction and in our case constructions are not people constructing the building but computers deploying software on, on something somewhere and then we also want to get into this area of trade-offs so yes developers should be able to define their uh, infrastructure requirements but also because they cannot ex express them precisely, we want to introduce the notion of policies and give them the opportunity to define the trade-offs. Do they want, uh, in this case, number of elements compared to still weight? So, in, in the world of computers, do they want more CPU power? Do they want more uh, networking throughput, lower latency? Now, obviously, you want to say, yeah, I, mean, I want everything, a lot of everything. Okay, if you want to pay, fine. That's also another trade-off. So this is a prototype we built for, for a system that basically shows how a developer might be able to deploy an application on some kind of cloud. And I'll continue with the presentation. So now imagine this is a system Heroku style, right? So you have you create a user, you, you need to go through some kind of wizard, and at the end your application is running on the cloud. So you start with the name of application, whatever. Now, you need to specify the policies, basically trade-offs of your application. You say, this is my budget, and these are, and those are not specific numbers, right? So it's not specifically 7.5 CPUs, of course. Right? It means, I know that my application will use a lot of CPU and I don't care about elasticity. So I just want to set it up. I don't care if it will be automatically scaled or doesn't. So there are certain things that are more important for me and others less. 
And this is my budget. So this is the overall policy for the entire application. Then you say, I have all these uh, uh, services. Now, service is not a, uh, it's not a container. It's not a task. It's, not, it's, it's a service. So if you, if you will, it's a microservice. It doesn't matter what's the size of it. In this case, it's Elasticsearch. So now if you say Elasticsearch, I want it. You can, you can, it goes to some kind of store. It gets you multiple versions, doesn't matter what, what is written there, but it's basically different levels of, uh, of services. Very, very similar to what Luke showed earlier about uh, silver, gold, and platinum or something like that in, uh, in uh, Flutter support. So you can get more features or more support if you pay more money. So you choose multiple services, in this case Elasticsearch, Kibana, Flocker, uh, React, whatever. Now, you can also select your own service, we'll call it something. You select a GitHub link, and, and basically you create, you add existing services to your environment. Those are not running services here. This is just architectural overview. We're just building the system. Now you can redefine or re refine the policies for each service. Uh, and you can define connections between the services. You can also define the policies on the network. You can say it is critical that between these two services the networking will all, always have latency less than something. So those are the terms developers understand. Latency, low latency is important when you develop applications. But how much and how it's achieved, which kind of routers you, you want to put in the middle, I don't want to know. As a developer, I don't even understand how they are built and how they are configured. Don't want to know. So fine, okay. I, now, now I can say, okay, this and this service will run on premise, and this two will run on Cisco Cloud, and this one will run on Amazon. And I say, do the magic. Right? Magic means go to the cloud. Figure or multiple clouds, figure out what's going on there, what is available, how much it costs, and give me options with trade-offs. Now, for example, I want to, to say I want the cheapest one and a bit cheaper. Uh, so now, obviously it's your choice now as a developer. Right? As much, you can also define certain different, some of the pieces of this. Okay, so, so far it was just configuring the system. Now you deploy, now this is a real running system. And as you saw now, we moved from development view, from architectural view into operational view without any change. Change of interface, change of tool. Now you can add multiple layers of information. And it doesn't really matter what, but like in this case it's how much money each connection, each service costs you. Uh, then you can say, this is uh, alerts, and then uh, you can go to simulation and you can refine your policies and say, okay, if, uh, if this service is, uh, so you can actually see here a real simulation. You can say, add a million users, let's see what, what's going to happen. And then you see containers added, added to the system. And if, uh, uh, if you run out of budget, you have an option to add more money, or not. Or you have an option to say, actually service, uh, that this service, I probably don't care much about it. So let's kill it automatically when, let's kill this one, when this one reaches uh, maximum capacity or something like that. So this kind of decision should be taken automatically based on the capabilities of the cloud. Okay, so back to right. So, is it a science fiction? Is it possible to to build right now? Science fiction? No. Achievable right now in the next six months? Maybe. Yeah. Okay. okay. Too tired. Fine. <laughs> right, so let's go back to Docker. Now, Docker actually has a very good model, which, is not, which was not invented by Docker. You have a Docker file, which is a source, imagine a Java file. Then you have uh, uh, 
a binary that you can run locally, and then you have uh, uh, a central repository like Nexus or Docker Hub, and then everyone else can reuse it. So this is a standard model. Now, the problem with Docker is that, as I said already, it's about a single container. It's not about service. And, and at this point, container doesn't do anything or doesn't do enough from my perspective. What I want to know is about service. So when I have a Elasticsearch service, I don't really care how many containers are there inside. I don't care where they are running, on which cloud, how they are connected to each other. From my perspective, the only interesting information does it do what I want it to do with whatever resources it has. So what we want to achieve is some kind of definition of a service with all the connections, with all the containers or tasks or whatever they are running, then some kind of local environment to, implement, to run it, then some kind of store and the deployment platforms. But not for a single container, not for a single process, but for a service on multi-cloud hybrid environments. So, how we define a service? That, that's the first question. Actually, technically speaking, this is the last task we, we did from everything I'm going to talk about. Because this is the most, probably the most difficult task right now. So, Basically, the context, our context right now, our tool set is heavily based on Mesos. It doesn't mean that Mesos is better than others. It, it's not the point. The point is that we just know Mesos better and we understand how to do things inside Mesos. That's why our solutions typically will be in the Mesos world. But the same way they can be implemented anywhere. So this is, this is part of our new UI for Mesos that is not available yet, but in, in, we're building it now. So you can see master, you can see all the physical nodes and some clusters. So if you specify a specific framework, then you can see where it is deployed, maybe multiple times. Okay, so we do know how, we do know how to build frameworks. So far, it's not, it's not easy, but it's possible. So uh, we want to use this knowledge to, to do something like this. So we want to create a language, which is currently, current implementation is in Groovy, which is essentially a scripting language on top of JVM. So the benefit of Groovy is that it, is, it can be easily embedded within Java application. So the, the interpreter can run inside the application itself. And then we want to create a language where we can say, <coughs> given average load on my service, higher than 80% scale twice, right? So just translate it to human language. <coughs> if the load on my specific cluster, on my specific service is higher than 80%, auto scale with twice as much containers as many. Or scale up as a single function, right? That, that's the level of uh, of programmable, uh, programmability that we want to achieve in this kind of languages. I, I, I personally don't think that Docker is enough or general Docker file because generally the uh, declarative way of doing things is just not uh, enough to express uh, complex things like, for example, this one. Let's say you have a financial application that Let's say if this uh, index, some kind of uh, stock exchange index, is going up more than 30%, then create some kind of Spark job automatically and execute it and, and collect the results. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with this kind of jobs, but in today's world, it will take quite a while to achieve it. So what we want to do is to be able to write this kind of programs where the infrastructure is actually part of the code. The infrastructure is when you say, I want another cluster of Elasticsearch, you just run one command inside your language, inside your normal language, Go, Java, C++, doesn't matter, and you just get it. Now the implementation is, uh, is actually, actually quite simple. 
So it's a, it's a Java framework, exactly the same as, uh, very similar to Elasticsearch framework. We just remove some of the pieces that are relevant or specific for Elasticsearch and replace them with Groovy Interpreter. And that's it. So we just inject this code I showed earlier inside the same framework that already supports the elastic scaling and other functionality. By doing that, we can create services with multiple containers, multiple roles, and multiple whatever, and connect it to each other, and running on multiple clouds in few minutes or few hours. Same as, as you can create Docker containers. So, okay, fine, we define the language. Uh, just this is not the final language. This is just one of the possibilities. And clearly, we need to improve and expand it. And similar things should happen on, on other backends, on Kubernetes, on Swarm. Uh, we need to have real programming language that can express, pro or we can actually write code that expresses the infrastructure. So, OK, next, testing and experiments. And one of the biggest things with tools related to DevOps, like Chef, Puppet, and Ansible, that developers are just not capable of using them. It's very, very difficult because creating a similar environment on the laptop is very difficult. Uh, especially Puppet and Chef. So what we want to create is, is an, a, a simple local environment that is the same as a uh, as larger scale cloud environment. So that's why while building Mesos frameworks, we created Mini Mesos. A Mini Mesos is uh, originally was a simple tool to to test Mesos frameworks. Now Mesos is a complex uh, system to to start up, and it's very difficult to build frameworks if you cannot test them. If if restart of the system takes forever, and forever for me is like five minutes. Uh, so what we want to do is create a Mesos cluster in, in a second, install the framework, execute the system test, and go on. So today you can do mini Mesos app, start a fully functional cluster within Docker containers on, on the laptop, and you can do uh, mini Mesos install JSON file with the, the framework, which is essentially only a single piece of framework that will redeploy the missing pieces on its own using Marathon, and then you can say Mesos destroy. And this tool will, is already available on, there is a website, Mini Mesos something. Uh, yeah, just look for Mini Mesos. Uh, and we think it's a, uh, so first we started building it for testing, but I think even, even more important goal for, for Mini Mesos and similar tools is to be able to experiment easily with Mesos. Because today, starting Mesos cluster is very difficult. That's why very few people do it. It's also very important that it will happen on local environment and not on a cloud. So you don't need to, to put your credit card and pay anything. So, okay. Next, the delivery platform. Okay, one of them is mini Mesos, another is standard Mesos, and then the one that is uh, actually uh, I'll just start talking about this. And, uh, uh, so Mantle is, uh, is a Cisco project led by Cisco and we are taking part in it and helping Cisco to build it. So Mantle is that uh, platform that includes Mesos and Docker and all other tools and all these things that it took you six months to build. So they are all needed. They are all relevant. It's just too difficult to build them. And every time new companies start building this stuff, they start integrating them, and they're doing it a bit differently, and they are, it's, it's just a lot of work. And there is no real point to, to spend all this time to integrate the same tools over and over again. So Mantle is, is a Cisco initiative to create a consistent platform that supports everything. You don't need to understand yet what it does. I'll, I'll go step by step. As you saw on Martha's presentation, I have step-by-step -step explanation. Yeah, by the way, most of the visuals I'm using right now created by Remember to Play and 
as Martha said before, it's, it's essential for, for thinking and, and uh, planning purposes to use graphical representation of this kind of systems. Because even with this diagram, I, I can't really believe you, you really understand this, right? But imagine I need to explain it with words. So, uh, right, so let's start from, from the beginning. You have a local data center on premise plus some cloud like Amazon. And you have the typical DevOps or whoever is deploying stuff here. So they can use networking, storage, and some virtual machines. Fine, so now let's start using Montor. So now you have operations person, the person who is responsible to maintain the cloud. He has the provisioning and automation tools. First he starts with Terraform. Again, those are just a bunch of tools integrated together creating consistent platforms. So first, Terraform can provision virtual machines, configure networking, and actually do bare metal deployments too. So if you have just a rack of servers, you stick in the server, you want it to be provisioned with uh, operating system, networking, and everything else. So this is all part of Montel uh, uh, standard deployment. So then, you deploy Montel, which is essentially Mesos. Right, Mantle is Mesos with a bunch of other things. So you deploy Mantle <coughs> with virtual machines with Mantle clients. Then you deploy internal services that we call infrastructure services, things like console or Elasticsearch or Kibana or all kind of things that are frameworks inside Mesos. And then higher level cloud services. Those are services with specific purpose, like monitoring, logging scaling. So those are services that you can use in that language that I showed before. So you can say, uh, I'm, when I have an application as a developer, I have microservices application, I can put it on the cloud and use those services, those cloud services natively as they are part of my code. And then essentially the entire cloud becomes a single machine, a single virtual big machine that is distributed across uh, multiple data centers, clouds, and whatever else you have. So essentially this is the goal for, for Mantle, is to allow developers to put, uh, and Shift is, is, uh, is a tool to put services on Mantle. So that, that, presentation, well, that uh, demo I showed earlier with uh, services and, and policies and stuff, this is all eventually will be part of Shift. So you go through definition of these uh, services, connecting them, defining policies, and then deploying them on one gigantic machine, which is actually distributed across everywhere. Yeah, and, uh, and also <coughs> the policies that I use, the, the spider web diagrams, that are uh, defined here and then uh, can be reused and reinforced on all levels inside the cloud. So what's next? Okay, we have this, like, this is cool. So what's next? <coughs> so recently, like a few months ago, I read this, first this book, the box. Uh, it's not about software containers, it's about those metal boxes. Right. It, oh, like yeah. this real <laughs> physical containers. <laughs> and, and, you know, you would love it, like how, how they're really related. Those are, okay, it's the same world, but this is totally different world <laughs> we're talking about. It's a physical world. But it, 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 it was very weird realization somewhere in the middle of the book that everything I read so far was the same in software containers more or less same ideas, more or less same things happen. And then from the middle of the book, it feels like a science fiction. Like, what would I like to see in the future? So, the interesting thing is that, so imagine, in, uh, it started end of 1950s. They introduced these containers, and the first thing that, that was changed, obviously, is those uh, uh, people working in the ports and putting stuff on the ships, right? Obviously, those people were out of their jobs within two years. Uh, which is, in a way, operations, right? DevOps, somehow. 
Now, next thing happened, ports changed entirely. So ports today do not look the same as ports in six, 70 years ago. They have these huge cranes, they only do one thing, put containers on ships as fast as possible, nothing else. Except 10% of the other stuff like cars and oil, which is kind of on the side. But then weird things started happening that no one predicted. Factories started moving from the cities with harbors inland, right, from New York to inner America. And then even weirder things happened. They started moving to China. So, uh, end of the book, end of the box book, they basically say the real, the real revolution was supply chains, not the containers. So what is possible now is, is to create a supply chain with different suppliers working around the world and optimize the value not on a single factory, but on the entire supply chain. It means that you can actually measure how much cost you have on shipping Barbie hair to China and then bringing it back as a finished product. And it's actually cheaper than, than assembling the entire, uh, the entire toy in the same place. So this is the real revolution. It means uh, Today, 90% or 80 or 90% of the goods moving around the world inside containers are not finished goods, but intermediate parts of something else. So, essentially, you can measure added value between each stations, and you can decide things like, it's cheaper for me to send this thing to be painted in China, because the labor cost is cheaper there, and transportation cost is, uh, is low enough to still make it uh, uh, cheaper for the entire product. That's why 100 years ago, Ford company owned forests and oil pumps and everything, the entire supply chain, and today, they essentially uh, managing supply chain. They almost do anything, nothing. I mean, they almost do nothing except, except this. Being in the middle, collecting the information about everything, about suppliers and distributors, and optimizing the entire flow. So that's, that's the real revolution that happened following the physical containers. So, we basically believe that the same thing is going to happen in software. And today, if you are, we are building microservices, right, and using containers, and using services, and putting them on the cloud. And we're still doing it mostly within the single company. And we think that the main goal for this is to optimize the work of that specific company. Twitter building 50, 100, 200 different microservices and deploying them frequently, continuously on the cloud. Yeah, that's fine, but that's not the real goal. The real goal is to create a supply chain of different companies, different, building different pieces of software and assembling it in some final uh, factory like a car is assembled today. And then distributed across everything. Now you can say, um, yeah, but how, how it, like, if, if I have a toy, like Barbie, when I ship it after, like, I, I sell it to somebody, I cannot change it later. I cannot change the color of the hair, and I cannot uh, do anything. So how can I change my microservice after it was deployed? Right? But that, then the question is, what is the final product of our uh, supply chain? So imagine Twitter. Like, a Twitter engine is not a final product. The Services are not final products. The versions of a service is not final product, but the tweets are. Right? So when tweet is out, it's like a Barbie sold to somebody. And then Twitter is just sitting here and coordinating 
all the supply chain to make sure that the software is built the most, in the most optimal way. So then if we go back to Monto and we see in cost for each microservice and for each transition from that service to another service and each uh, basically consumption of everything can be measured in dollars, then we can take decisions based on the overall cost of the production of a specific tweet. And then we can change this provider with another provider just because they are cheaper, just because they are more effective. Just because it doesn't matter where they're located, in China, in Ukraine, in, in Amsterdam, in US, you can just randomly replace a software vendor if another software vendor can do it for cheaper. So, yeah, and, and we think there are two different, at least so far it feels like a different distinct uh, process. One is building the cloud itself, that's what we do, by building Mantle and building other tools, but also Amazon does it and other companies, and, and the application builders who are actually using this stuff, and together you create uh, a deployment and a distribution. So Amazon Cloud, oh, it, it can look something like uh, this is Amazon building the cloud, this is Twitter building the application, this Actually, this is some kind of service provider. This is Twitter collecting everything and deploying on Amazon and distributing to the, to the users. Something like that. Yeah, so we tried to map all kind of technology on this map. This is actually not really interesting. The, the, most inter the only interesting part here is we couldn't identify any players on the market right now that do optimization of of the supply chain of software. There is a lot of people doing building clouds, building applications, building microservices. There is a lot of people doing deployments, like everyone. And there's a lot of people doing security and continuous integration and all this other stuff that we're talking all the time about. But no one actually really sees the optimization of the entire pipeline, the handover before, from the supplier to the next supplier. Uh, so we had some ideas how to do it. This, these are just ideas, nothing implemented. But the idea is to create a single flow that starts with a developer through building and then composition of services into bigger and bigger systems that eventually reach uh, the user. And the idea is that this is a system, same as, as I showed with uh, the application intent demo, it's a system that is covering everything from beginning of the build process until the final delivery of the tweet to the user. And each one of those intermediate services can be also reused by other vendors. So you're not consuming binaries from other vendors, but you're actually consuming services from the other vendors. And those services can provide same services to multiple providers, like uh, uh, tires factory provides tires to multiple car vendors. And that's it. Questions? So let's imagine this future of a supply chain for software. What do you think would be the the, the blueprint between the parts, how do vendors communicate on the, on the interface between these components? So the same way as they do today, but, but they do it manually on the paper. And there is a contract, which is SLA. When I do something, I have an SLA as a provider. I promise to deliver this piece of software by that time, with this quality, with this whatever, boundaries, right? Same thing should be fully automated as part of your contract that is part of the code. So I'm agreeing to accept this, like acceptance testing, right? So if I can test that your service performing this way, it's fine. If not, you don't get the money. If you look at the supply chain management, you all can have all kinds of tools to optimize your supply chain. Are you also looking into that? Yes, yeah, so actually, that's a very good point, and I tried to look on that. They're just so ugly, I can't even understand how to use them. 
But, uh, but that's true. So starting from 80s, there is a lot of work done on optimizing supply chains. There are companies, like huge companies like Walmart, that the entire business model is managing supply chain. Not selling products, but <coughs> managing supply chains. And they're using software that is very effective and collects all the information. So all the information is there, all the capabilities are there. We just need to translate it into software. <laughs> Um, very nice talk. Um, it seems that we're witnessing the colonization of, the, of, the, of computation, right? Um, I'm curious, what will be next? What, where, where will people be able to add value in all this thing? We already see um, big companies uh, becoming masters of managing their supply chain. You already mentioned Walmart, I think Apple is another big example. On the IT side, what will be the, where, where will the value be added? I mean, if, if half of our time we spend on testing and fixing some stuff that will be done automatically, you can just build more stuff. It's like you can buy a, a bigger car, right? Same, same thing. In the US, everyone driving these huge monstrous cars because they can. So essentially, you can create more innovation. You can create more things on the same cloud. If you don't deal with the cloud half of, the, of your time, yeah, just invent some rocket or something. I don't know. <laughs> and that is all we've got time for. A big round of applause, please.